Okay, a very good evening, everyone. By my watch, it's now 7.30, so we can start our March film reading session. Thank you all for joining me this evening. Uh, for those of you who are new to these sessions, just a very brief introduction. My name is Ian, and I'm a radiologist. I graduated from the RVC way back in 2004 and got my RCBS imaging certificate in 2009. I did my imaging residency again back at the RVC between 2013 and 2016 and got my diploma in 2018. And these days, you can find me <coughs> at London Veterinary Specialists, which is the only multidisciplinary referral hospital in central London. So if you'd like to have a chat about anything imaging related, um, if you have a challenging case and you're wondering which imaging modality might be most useful in reaching a diagnosis, or if you have some radiographs that you need a little hand interpreting, then feel free to give me a call at the clinic or drop me a line via email. Uh, this evening we will be using the Poll Everywhere software and that should allow everybody to participate and if you would like to vote on some of the cases then you need to go online and uh, log into pollev.com and then type in Ian David Joni 636 as your username and at various points during the presentation you will see questions appear which you need to respond to and hopefully, if the software works, it will sync up with my presentation and then we can discuss the results. So one of the things that we do in these pre meeting sessions before I open up the floor and hand it over to you guys to review some of these cases is just to look at an example. And this is a case that we looked at uh, last month. It's a two-year-old large crossbreed dog that's presented as coffin. Those of you who joined me last month will hopefully remember this case. We've got two radiographs, a right lateral thoracic radiograph, which is poorly centered, so we've missed the cranial part of the thorax, and we've included a little more of the cranial abdomen than we'd like, and we have a dorsoventral thoracic radiograph. Uh, if we start by looking at the right lateral radiograph, hopefully you guys can appreciate the air bronchograms that are present, superimposed over the cranial aspect of the cardiac silhouette. And those air bronchograms are indicative of consolidation of the lung in that region. On the dorsoventral radiograph, um, what we have is a lobar sign separating the caudal part of uh, the uh, the left cranial lung lobe, so this, this left right marker is incorrect, um, and a lobar sign separating the uh, caudal part of the left cranial lung lobe and the left caudal lung lobe. And we can also see there's a few sticky little bronchograms um, in the dorsoventral projection as well. If we go back to the right lateral radiograph um, and we describe in a little more detail um, the distribution of these air bronchograms in that consolidated lung. Um, I think you will agree that these changes have a ventral distribution, um, so we can only really see them in the ventral part of the cranial thorax. Um, the rest of the thorax um, looks relatively normal. Um, we might be tempted to say that this pulmonary parenchyma um, is a little bit more opaque than we might expect, and there are a few little donuts as well, so um, we we wouldn't be wrong to describe this pulmonary parenchyma as having a very mild bronchodistitial pattern, um, but it's certainly not the most pertinent change here. It's these air bronchograms. And in the dose of ventral view, those air bronchograms that have a ventral distribution, and we can see are affecting the caudal part of the left cranial lung lobe. Um, so this dog um, had uh, an aspiration pneumonia, um, and uh, as I remember, this dog presented um, for vomiting. Um, so the ventral distribution um, and uh, the description of the location, so the, um, the caudal part of the left cranial lung lobe should make up the majority of your radiograph description. And the conclusion um, is, in this case, uh, because of the type of change of the consolidation, specifically because of the distribution, the ventral distribution, the most likely diagnosis here is aspiration. Yeah. Okay, so uh, do any of you guys have any questions about this example? This is where we test our online polling software. So I've just activated the first question. So for those of you who have logged in, you should see that question appear. And if you'd like to respond just now, 
I can see that uh, a few of you have responded, which is great. I'll just give you a couple more minutes. All right, let's just sync this up and see if the software is going to behave itself. Yeah, would you mind to just share again the login, please? Okay, so let's just see if that's worked. Yeah, so 100% of you that responded, um, and that's five people, have no questions about this example, which is great. Um, I could hear the faint voice of B in the background asking if I could share the login details again. And yeah, absolutely. So we just look back to the start. So those are the login details. So in order to log in, um, you need to go to uh, poolev.com and then enter in my username, which is Ian David Juni, uh, missing the S636. Uh, like I said, um, at various points during this evening's presentation, we will see some questions appear. Um, then you guys can respond to them. All right, so having done an example and tested the online polling software, we can get to case number one. Right, so this is a two-year-old male-neutered domestic short-haired cat that's presented to you as dyspneic. So we have a couple of radiographs for you guys to comment on, so a right lateral thoracic radiograph, and we have a dorsoventral we have a left lateral thoracic radiograph. Okay, so at this point, hopefully at least one of you is feeling brave. I would like to just take us through these radiographs. And, and once you're done, uh, we can give everybody else a go and open up the online polling to uh, one of the questions that I have regarding this case. So anybody fancy taking us through case number one? Any volunteers? Plenty of people in this evening session, so there's at least 15 of you if I discount Luke and Farouk. So this is a, a safe environment, and this case um, is not in any danger. Nobody's being examined, and the more you contribute, the more you get out of these sessions. So anybody fancy just taking me through case number one? Tell me what you think. This is a young cat, it's two years old. It's a male neuter domestic short here. And it's presented to you as Disney. Nobody fancies case number one. I can I can get it started, um, but um, I'm gonna need some help. That's fine. Yeah, no, that's that's what these sessions are all about. Okay, so um, there are two lateral radiographs, a left and a right, and a, a VD as well, I believe. Um, the skin and subcutaneous structure looks normal to me, um, as do the skeletal structures, so the ribs, sternum, and scapula. Um, on the uh, the right lateral, um, looking at the lung fields, I thought that um, that they were kind of overinflated. That maybe the the diaphragm was maybe a little bit flatter and that the caudal lung field was extending pretty pretty caudally. Um, I'm not sure if that you would agree or not. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, no, totally agree. Then the 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 cardiac silhouette um, looks pretty small. Um, so it's only taking up sort of half um, of the vertical space and only two rib spaces. Um, actually going back to the lung fields, um, there was, I think, increased opacity, generalized sort of opacity in the caudal, caudal field maybe. Um, and I probably would categorize it as a bronchointerstitial pattern maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm getting a bit um, a less, less confident as I go on. Um, oh, and, you're doing super well. Thank you. Um, so on the... On the VD, um, the heart looks like it's shifted a little bit to the left side, um, which I feel would be ab abnormal, um, but I can actually see a reason for it, so I'm not sure how to explain it. Um, and then actually I had, <laughs> I had a question about, about that view, um, sort of coming, oh yeah, and the cat has also on the left side uh, an extra 
floating rib. Um, yeah, good spot. I had a question about um, the the right. Um, I think it's the right main bronchus. I feel like it's better visualized than on the left side, but it may be that the heart is interfering with that. Yeah, I think um, you can just about see the left main stem bronchus and the left caudal lumbar bronchus. Just here. Yeah. Um, I had a question about um, sort of a soft tissue opacity coming from T12 bilaterally and going forward kind of symmetrically. I wasn't sure what this, I was looking at. This, this thing here. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely, to, you're absolutely right to ping that. That is an abnormality. Um, okay. Uh, no, I like your description. And um, I like the fact that you have uh, picked up on uh, this uh, unusual opacity um, in this VD radiograph. Um, so uh, before we move on and um, I uh, hit you guys with the next polling question, um, so what were your conclusions here? My conclusion. We, we were able to conclude. Yeah, a small uh, kind of small heart, not necessarily okay. microcardia, but okay. um, smaller than normal. Yep. Um, a little bit uh, overinflation. Yeah. Um, uh, I think bronchointerstitial pattern and um, kind of linear, I don't know how to, the linear soft tissue yeah. opacity of some sort, whether it's abnormal in between those two opacities or those are the actual abnormalities in yeah. I'm stuck. Okay, no, that's a, no, yeah, excellent description. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just open up the floor uh, with uh, our second question of the evening, so I'm going to activate it, and just ask you guys, um, based on the excellent description that we've just, hear, just heard, um, what, what is everybody most concerned about? Um, do we think that we're most concerned about the cardiac silhouette and the vasculature? Um, we've commented that the heart looks a little bit smaller than it should do. Um, are we concerned there might be something going on in the mediastinum or the mediastinal structures? Um, do we think uh, there's anything else happening with the pulmonary vasculature. So there are those two linear soft tissue opacities within the caudal thorax that we can see in that VD view. Is that something to worry about? Do we think that, that they might represent large vessels and there might be something sinister going on here, like maybe a pulmonary thromboembolism? Um, or is there something else going on? Is there something in the extra thoracic structures that um, we're concerned about? Okay, let's see what everybody thinks. Just sync that up. All right, let's see what the results are. So, a bit of a mixed bag. So most people plumping for uh, the media style and the media style structures as being the thing they'd be most concerned about. But a few people um, concerned about the heart and, and maybe also the extra thoracic structures. Okay, let's go back to the radiographs and, and the BD initially. So um, you're absolutely right to pick out uh, these linear soft tissue opacities here because that, that is abnormal and you wouldn't normally expect to see opacities uh, in this region um, in um, a DV or a VD radiograph. And we can get more of an idea as to what these structures might be by having another look at these lateral radiographs. So um, I absolutely agree that there is um, a mild diffuse bronchointerstitial pattern here, but if we compare the opacity of the dorsal thorax to the ventral thorax and particularly just cranial and dorsal to the heart base it almost looks more lucid in that region and if you take a look at the location of the trachea you just get the suggestion that it might be a little bit ventrally displaced and if we look even more closely at the trachea we can see that just dorsal to the tracheal lumen we've got this soft tissue opaque opacity. Again, it, it looks quite linear and it, it appears to run right the way from the cranial thorax, right the way to the margins of the diaphragm. And um, what that is, I think, is, is a tracheal stripe sign. And one of the things that we'd expect to see if we're picking up a tracheal stripe sign is, is an enlarged esophagus. And if there is an enlarged esophagus here, then what sort of changes we'd expect to see? Well, um, if the esophagus was really big and it was filled with gas, then we might expect to see some changes 
to the opacity of the pulmonary parenchyma that's adjacent to it and superimposed over it um, in these lateral radiographs. And that might explain why particularly the cranial and the dorsal thorax looks quite hyperlucent. Um, if we've got a really big gas-filled esophagus uh, in the mediastinum, because that's where it sits, um, it potentially could displace some of the other mediastinal structures like the trachea um, and like the cardiac similar. And certainly if this esophagus were uh, enlarged and, and filled with gas, then that, that might be responsible for just this slight ventral displacement of the tracheal lumen that we're seeing here. And then we can think, okay, well, how would we expect a big gas-filled esophagus to appear <coughs> on a DD radiograph? The answer is, well, we might ex expect it to appear uh, a little bit like this. Um, so what we're actually seeing here is these, these soft tissue acidities that we can see represent the, the walls um, of the esophagus. Um, and it's, it's full of gas. So this, this is the esophagus here in this view, and then, and then this is the esophagus here in this view. Um, so this, this cat has a really big um, generalized megaesophagus. Um, so uh, megaesophagus um, is uh, the main ra radiographic finding here. <coughs> now, I've been a bit sneaky, um, and I've told you that this cat um, presented as dyspneic. Um, so um, you know, what you should be paying most attention to um, is the lungs. And um, the main radiological finding here is in the mediastinum, and it's because it has um, this, this big megaesophagus. The reason why I included it is you don't see megaesophagus um, that often, and certainly not a megaesophagus is as big as this um, in a cat um, too often. And this cat actually presented um, because it had an upper a partial upper respiratory tract obstruction. This is a cat that had a history of laryngeal paralysis, um, and unfortunately, the paralysis um, had uh, recurred after previous surgical fixation. So it was just struggling a little bit with its upper airway, so it was, it was gulping in a lot of air. And um, we think that, that that might be potentially responsible for the megaesophagus. However, um, there are lots of other reasons for a patient to have a megaesophagus. And, um, Another reason for me to include this case, um, as well as to demonstrate the sort of radiological changes that you'd expect to see with a megaesophagus, particularly that tra tra tracheal slab sign and the associated displacement of the trachea, and then also uh, the fact that we can see the esophageal walls in this VD view, is just for us to think a little bit about um, the sort of differentials that we might need to consider in a patient um, presenting with a megaesophagus, because they are many and, and varied really. Um, the sort of differentials that we uh, should be thinking about here, well, um, it could be an idiopathic microsophagus now. It's, it's less likely in this case because um, we don't see uh, an ET tube here, so this cat is an anesthetized, and so it's, it's much less likely um, to be idiopathic. So we, quite often you'll see um, gas within the esophagus, sometimes a big generalized microsophagus in anesthetized patients. But this, this cat doesn't look like it's anesthetized, there's no ET tube we can see. So maybe that's slightly less likely. Um, it could be a congenital megaesophagus. This is a young cat. Um, it could be acquired. So there are a few things that um, can cause a megaesophagus. If you have a patient that has a history of, of chronic vomiting, for example, then um, the, um, the persistent reflux and the uh, resulting esophagitis can cause a megaesophagus. Um, other congenital problems, um, like hiatal hernia, for example, um, can result in um, megaesophagus. Um, then you get into more weird and wonderful things um, like, uh, like a dysautonomia in a dog and, and in cats. Um, that's called key gaskell syndrome. And then other things um, like uh, neuropathies and myopathies uh, and some toxicities. Um, and in the list of uh, congenital problems that might cause uh, esophageal dilatation, although it tends to be more focal for these sorts of things, would be things like vascular ring anomalies. Um, so yeah, this is a, a young cat that presented um, with a suspected uh, recurrent laryngeal paralysis, which in itself is kind of weird in a cat. Um, and this is what its chest looked like. So um, it had um, a really big megaesophagus. So this is a nice case uh, just to remind us uh, what a big megaesophagus might look like, and also to consider um, what sort of differentials there are um, for patients that present um, with a megaesophagus. So there we go. Um, anybody have any questions about uh, case number one before we move on. And if you're a little bit shy to speak up, um, then you can always ping me via the chat. I will do my best to keep half an eye on it. I have to say that occasionally I forget to check the chat, um, but I will do my best to keep half an eye if you have any questions via the chat. All right.
So if we've got no questions, then we should move on to case number two, which is a seven year old male neutered cocker spaniel. Um, this little doggy has um, intermittent right falling lameness. <coughs> so um, we've got uh, four radiographs to have a look at. So um, we've got uh, orthogonal views of both the right um, and the left elbow. Um, so neutral mediolaterals and uh, craniocaudal views of both elbows. Um, so um, any of you guys feeling in an orthopedic kind of mood this evening? I can give a go. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so there are two orthogonal view on the right and left elbow. Uh, starting from the craniocaudal, you can see um, new bone formation and osteophyte uh, on the medial aspect uh, of the humerus. Okay. Then moving uh, to the lateral view, I can see like sclerosis. Uh, around the joint and the trochlear notch. I cannot really follow very well the coronary process and as well on the, I would say, dorsal aspect of the radius, there are as well there some osteophyte and like newborn formation. If we move on the, if we compare with the left, uh, I can see as well similar changes there. So um, I would say that this dog got a elbow disease affecting both limb. Yeah. Uh, my main differential uh, would be elbow dysplasia and probably a fragmentation of the coronary process. I would say that probably for me, the changes are more evident on the lives on the left side compared to the right, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. No. Well, that's good. So, um, so what was your sort of final diagnosis here, or your your differentials? So, I would would put like top differential. Uh, uh, fragmentation of the coronoid process. Okay. Um, uh, and what what features, what radiographic features? So you have, you can, uh, yeah, have sclerosis to, of the trochlear notch, and you cannot really follow the shape, uh, follow the yeah, the shape of the coronoid process. So you should see uh like a triangular shape where the medial coronary process should be okay and instead the there there are like increase of bone opacity sclerosis okay. yeah okay no i think that's that's fine um so let's uh have a little run through these radiographs. so I, I absolutely agree and there certainly are changes to both of these elbow joints that are a little bit concerning. Um, so um, if we uh, take a look at uh, the usual suspects essentially, so the locations where we expect to see changes in dogs that have elbow disease, and um, what we're looking for really in the first instance uh, are osteophytes. Um, so do we think we can see any osteophytes here? And as Bates pointed out, yeah, we, we certainly can see some osteophytes in both elbows. Uh, the changes are similar in both, so we'll just stick to the right elbow for now. So if we look at the uh, medial part of the right humeral condyle, you can see there's um, some aberrant bone um, located just distal to the medial epicondyle. And that aberrant bone probably re represents a few mature osteophytes. Um, sticking to the craniocaudal view, um, one of the things that is uh, super important to describe here is, is this little mineralized structure. Um, so there's a, a small, clearly marginated mineralized structure in this craniocaudal view that's, that's just adjacent to the medial coronoid process. So the medial coronoid process is much easier to see in the craniocaudal view um, than the medial lateral view because it's not superimposed 
by the proximal part of the radius. So, and B's absolutely right that the medial coronoid um, you, you would expect to see here as a little triangle, but oftentimes um, it, it's, it's tricky to make out because of that superimposition. In the cranial cord view, um, we, we should be able to see it pretty clearly if you've got decently positioned straight cranial cord or radiographs, and, and the margins of the medial coronoid should be nice and smooth and sharp, and there certainly shouldn't be a small, clearly marginated, mineralized structure just adjacent to it. And if we just move our eyes distal to that structure, again, we can see that there's this aberrant bone here that is, is probably associated with, with the medial coronoid. Um, and that aberrant bone um, also uh, likely to be some osteophytes. So just looking at the cranial caudal view, um, we've got some osteophytes on the medial aspect of the humeral condyle. We've got this clearly marginated mineralized structure that's just adjacent to this medial coronoid. And then we've got some aberrant bone that's, that's just distal from that medial coronoid. I think it, it wouldn't be unreasonable to say it's associated with that medial coronoid. And then on the lateral view, um, it, it, it is absolutely correct that uh, one of the things that you'd expect to see in a patient with um, elbow disease and elbow dysplasia is you would expect to see some sclerosis associated with the trochlear notch, which is, is about here. Um, if, if we look at um, the, um, the bone of the ulna uh, stretching towards um, the olecranon, we can see there's this normal trabecular bone pattern there. It, it, it does get a little bit more radio-opaque around the trochlear notch. Um, it, it's not too severe here, um, but you might be able to convince me that it's, it's a little bit more opaque, so there might be a little bit of sclerosis there. Uh, the main changes for me in this lateral view are we, we've got, again, um, some big osteophytes, um, and uh, this is um, the, the cranial part of the proximal radius, um, so cranial um, rather than <coughs> dorsal, um, because of uh, where we are, so we're uh, proximal to the carpus, so cranial part of the proximal radius, um, and also um, on the anconeal process as well. Um, this is, I think, a slightly older dog, so um, it's, it's maybe less likely we're going to see things like um, an unattached anconeal process and um, a flexed view of the elbow, so a flexed medial lateral might make it easier um, to see the little fissure that's typical of an unattached anconeal process. That, that looks absolutely fine. That, that looks like it's intact, um, despite the fact that we've got some osteophytes here. Um, other things to check um, when you're evaluating um, elbows, um, is, is there any evidence of um, any uh, OCD, for example? Um, OCD, you typically expect to affect um, the medial part of the humeral condyle here. So we're looking for um, any change to the articular margins and the subconchal bone, so any flattening, um, any defects, um, any sclerosis of that bone, and that all looks fine. Um, other things to look out for uh, would be uh, maybe something like um, incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle. That's, that's something that we've seen fairly recently. So just have a, have a good look um, at the humeral condyle, make sure there aren't any uh, linear radiolucencies there that might re represent a little humeral fissure. They can be quite tricky to see. Um, and then if you're feeling super confident, um, you could comment on um, if you felt there was some dysplasia. So if, if you felt that the bones that make up this elbow joint on fitting together as well as they should do. And um, typically what I'd, I'd look at first, if I was trying to decide whether there was dysplasia, would, would be the position of, of the radius um, relative to the ulna at the level of the trochlear notch. Now, if you can see a, a big step there, then um, you can be reasonably confident that there's some dysplasia, although it, it can be a pretty tricky call uh, on, on a lot of cases. But here, I think the main changes are the osteophytes, they're in, they're in the typical locations, so cranial part of the proximal radius, anconeal process, humeral condyle, and associated with the medial coronary. And this, this little structure here um, it is, is curious, so we, we can't really tell if this is a big osteophyte um, or if it's a fragment. Um, so uh, we're not really seeing a, a, a defect in this um, medial coronary process, but you don't always really see big defects. Um, so it probably is just a big osteophyte because we've got big osteophytes elsewhere in these elbows, but we can't rule out a fragmented medial coronoid on the right um, or, or on the left because we've got similar changes um, in this left elbow as well. And, and osteophytes in similar places. So again, cranial, um, cranial part of proximal radius, anchoral process, um, maybe a little bit of sclerosis in this trochlear notch, and again, um, medial 
aspect of the humeral condyle, medial coronoid, um, and then we've got um, this, this mineralized structure here that's just adjacent to this medial coronoid process. Um, so uh, I think B is, is absolutely right. Um, this, this dog certainly does have changes compatible with um, a bilateral elbow osteoarthritis, um, and it may indeed have bilateral fragmented medial colonoids, and we, we can't be completely sure because these mineralized structures might just represent big osteophytes. And if we wanted to investigate this further, then a CT would be super useful. I mean, you can't always be confident about differentiating between a fragment that's originated from the medial coronoid and a large osteophyte even on CT, um, but it would certainly be um, helpful in this case. Okay, so that's case number two. Everybody happy with case number two? Any questions about B's description and, uh, and our discussion on it so far? Can I ask a question? Yeah. So in case for example, in this case, uh, we perform a CT, we recognize it's a huge osteophyte. Because yep. the animal is painful clinically, yep. would you recommend, although it's not um, a fragment from the coronoid process, would you recommend arthroscopy anyway? Um, uh, yeah, I think it wouldn't be unreasonable um, okay. if, if the patient um, was quite severely affected clinically uh, for an orthopod to take a look around the medial coronoid. Um, with, with the scope. Um, as I said, even on CT, it can be pretty challenging sometimes trying to decide whether this bit of bone that you're looking at has come from the medial coronoid or it's just a big mature osteophyte. And um, if you wanted to be absolutely certain, then yeah, you'd need to do arthroscopy and you'd need to have the orthopod cuddling around in there um, with the camera. Um, and the orthopedic surgeon with the camera should be able to tell definitively whether or not that is indeed a fragment that has escaped from the medial coronoid it was just a big osteophyte that's just associated with the job. Okay. Any other questions? Case number two. If not, we will move on to case number three. Let's skip that one. Which is an 11 year old female muted Jack Russell Terrier uh, that's presented with a little bit of weight loss. So this is it's an elderly dog, really non-specific clinical signs. Um, so um, just lost a little bit of weight. We've got some thoracic radiographs and, and this really is just because we're screening for disease. So don't really know why this dog has been losing weight. So let's do some imaging and let's start with the thorax. So we've got a right lateral and uh, we've got, uh, that's a DV. We've got our left lateral. So, anybody fancy having a go at case number three? I'm happy to have a go. Yeah, sounds good. So, we do have three radiographic projections with neck included um, of a skeletally mature dog. So, um, we can, there is a really focal subtle bridging um, ventral spondylosis within the um, lumbar, thoracic sp lumbar um, vertebra column. Um, the, the lung parenchyma uh, looks, um, on the caudal part, it looks um, slightly more radiopaque, like there is an, um, I think it's an artefactual um, unstructured interstitial pattern, uh, possibly due to aspiration. There is a partial mineralization of the um, tracheal rings, uh, which are more visible. Um, likely they are age related. And focus on the neck, there is a sort of uh, ill defined, rounded, ovoid shaped structure, uh, which is um, essentially ventral to the third and fourth um, cervical um, um, vertebra. Um, which potentially if partially face the trachea or potentially slightly cause um, a subtle ventral uh, concavity of it, like sort of um, ventral displacement or probably just a face partially, the dorsal aspect of the trachea. Oh, yeah, I think you're right, I think both. 
and um, this structure is also visible, is more visible on the right lateral, so probably I'm expecting is more on the left side, um, but is also visible on the left lateral projection, and on the left lateral we can partially see the, um, the wall of the esophagus, uh, with a bit of, uh, there is a sort of uh, uh, linear radiopacity and border by these two uh, radiopaic um, line, which I think are the uh, wall of the esophagus. So I think this structure to me is extra esophageal because if it was esophageal, I'm expecting some um, caudal or cranial uh, gas within the esophagus, so I'm, I'm expecting that the esophagus is supposed to be dilated uh, cranial to the structure, which I cannot really see, although the structure is really, um, is really in the cranial aspect. And, and the animal is, I mean, is not, uh, hasn't been referred for uh, like um, gagging or regurgitation or uh, inappetence. So on the DV, I can really visualize the structure, although, I don't know if it's just me, um, on just ventral um, 2C2, I can probably see a more radiopacity there, but I'm not completely sure, to be honest. So yeah. I, 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 I don't know if I can visualize the structure in the DV. Um, Essentially, we put as differential diagnosis all the structures that there are in the region of the cervical tract, like it can be um, a parathyroidal nodule, it can be a thyroidal nodule, it can be um, also um, an abscess of uh, the retrophalangeal lymph nodes, although probably they are slightly more cranial. Um, I would put also a um, car carotidal body tumor. So um, probably the next step would be um, ultrasound of the area or um, a CT scan of the area. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so actually, I don't know if I, if I missed something. No, no, I, 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 yeah, I think yeah. this is so, the main. Um, <laughs> So you, you really focused on the, uh, the cervical spine, um, and I think that's absolutely appropriate because um, I totally agree with all of your findings. Um, I'm just assuming that you're happy with the rest of the structure, so you're happy with the rest of the films. Yeah, I don't know if I yeah. missed something at this point, but um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I was happy with the abdomen as well. I don't think there is... Uh, like the cranial abdomen, I mean, the, the, the stomach, the gastric axis, it looks within the costal arch and possible there is um, the liver, possible at a bit of rounded margins, but it's still within the costal arch and probably we can see a bit of um, the proximal aspect of the descending colon gas field and uh, the, the other intestinal loops, they are fluid field and I mean, I, I can really appreciate uh, any any other um, alteration, but... Um, <laughs> no, I, I totally let, agree. Let me, let me know if <laughs> totally I'm wrong. Agree. No, no. Uh, so, no, excellent description. Um, yeah, can't fault it. Don't really have anything to add at all. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to see if uh, everybody else uh, agrees. I'm just going to activate the next question, so you guys um, should be able to see that now. Um, so, uh, essentially, do you guys agree? Um, do you think that the uh, main radiographic finding here is that um, roughly ovoid soft tissue opaque structure that's just dorsal to the cervical or trachea, um, just caudal to the larynx? Um, or have any of you guys seen anything else um, that you think we should be a little bit concerned about? So we'll just give it a little bit longer. You guys clearly having to think about this one a little bit. All right, let's sync this up and uh, we'll see if the group agrees. Okay, so let's see what we got. Uh, yeah, so everybody, I think, pretty much agrees. So 71% 
thanks um, extra thoracic structures and uh, the, the structure that you described um, certainly is extra thoracic and you might even say it could be something else so uh, either extra thoracic um, or something else might fit um, I mean it, this structure I suppose could be in the mediastinum if, if uh, actually no, it, could be, it could be in the mediastinum I was going to say if it was an esophageal lesion but the um, it would be, it would have to be the cervical esophagus, which is not in the mediastinum. So, so maybe somebody has seen something in the mediastinum that they're a little bit concerned about. So let's let's just go back to these radiographs and um, just summarize the changes um, very quickly before we take a look at um, what we did next. So uh, essentially, I don't have anything else to write. I, I I agree that I'm not really too concerned at all about the thorax um, or the cranial abdomen in this patient. Um, it, it's an old dog. Um, there is maybe. Uh, bronchodistitial pattern, but it's probably uh, normal and appropriate given the age of the patient. There are some other age-related changes, as you described, like a little bit of um, but, but certainly uh, nothing to really uh, tell us why this patient is losing weight and it's clinically unwell, um, except, um, as you described, this, um, it's, it's, it's reasonably well marginated in the we can describe it as ovoid, um, so we, we can see the margins. Um, it has a, a soft tissue opacity. Um, it's just caudal um, to the larynx, and dorsal to the trachea, um, and uh, as we described, it is effacing the margins, the dorsal margins of the trachea, and there's a little bit of displacement of the trachea as well, I think. It's just bulging a little bit ventrally. And all of the differentials that you come up with, I think, are completely reasonable. So. Um, I really liked uh, your uh, reasoning uh, in that you decided that this is unlikely to be an esophageal structure. It's unlikely to be an intraluminal esophageal structure because we're not seeing any other changes associated with the esophagus. So uh, one of the things to consider would be esophageal foreign body. It's not in a, a typical location for an esophageal foreign body, so it's, it's a little bit too cranial, really. So esophageal foreign bodies if they're going to uh, lodge themselves cranially, they, they do tend to make it to the level of the thoracic inlet. Um, or we'll see them around the heart base um, or, or between the heart base and the, and the cardiac sphincter. Um, but we can't completely rule that out. Um, but I really like the fact that you, know, you looked at the esophagus, decided you could see the esophageal walls and maybe a little bit of intraluminal gas, um, which all looked completely normal. And if, if the structure were within the esophagus, if it were intraluminal, then we'd expect to see some other changes. So we might expect to see some gas surrounding the structure um, or gas um, cranial to it or caudal to it. We might even expect to see some cranial dilatation of the esophagus. We can't see any of those things. So it's unlikely to be um, an esophageal lesion. Uh, I suppose it could be a, a paraesophageal lesion. Um, so Really, you'll get things uh, like paraesophageal abscesses. You don't tend to see them in this location. All the ones that I've seen have been more caudal. Um, you don't see changes in, to the lumen of the esophagus with paraesophageal lesions, um, but this, this would be really weird. And it's much more likely to be something associated with the structures that normally reside in that area, like the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, um, like the thyroid glands. Um, so for this uh, dog, um, we didn't do a CT. What we did do was an ultrasound, which um, gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, ultrasound of the neck um, and um, how you can go about finding thyroid glands. So this is um, an ultrasound image taken from this patient. And just um, so you guys can orient yourself, the patient um, is pretty much lying on um, his back. Um, and I've got the probe. Uh, it's a, a linear probe I'm using here. So it's a high frequency, so 15 megahertz linear probe. Um, and what I've done is I've uh, started just caudal to the caudal border of the mandible. And in that location, you would usually see the mandibular salivary glands. And uh, my usual routine is once I've found mandibular salivary glands to just slide the probe cranially, find the mandibular lymph nodes, then slide it caudally, just uh, deep to the mandibular salivary gland plans, you're going to see the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And then as you, as you slide further caudal, um, you'll see the larynx and the trachea. And at that point, that's when you start looking for the thyroids. So that's where I've got to here. And the landmarks for the thyroid glands are the trachea um, and then the carotid artery. And, and this, this is the trachea here. So we've got some tracheal rings and we've got some reverberation artifact because there's this gas the trachea and we've got the 
carotid artery here, and the thyroid glands sit um, between the trachea and the carotid artery. And um, here, rather than a normal thyroid gland, we've got this uh, big, clearly marginated, uh, hyperechoic, heterogeneous mass. And I wasn't able to find, uh, I think it was the, it was the right thyroid gland here. Um, what I did find instead was, was this big mass. And so it's, it's reasonable to conclude that not being able to find a normal thyroid and finding this mass instead, um, it's likely that this is a thyroid mass. And uh, that's how it looks in, in short axis. That's how it looked in long axis. Um, so this is the mass that we can see um, on that radiograph. And um, it's, uh, it has a very mixed actionicity, this um, mass. So the cranial pole of it looks more kind of hypo to, to anechoic, and we've got a much more heterogeneously echoic caudal pole, um, something to be very mindful of, and a good reason to not blindly FNA these sorts of masses is that these thyroid masses can be extremely vascular. So this one um, we did actually FNA, so then there are some, some big vessels uh, dotted around this mass, so I needed to be careful, um, but I was happy enough that I could get a needle into this thing without hitting any of these big vessels. Um, but uh, a word of caution for you guys, um, if, if you are ever intending to blindly FNA thyroidal masses like this, um, uh, I've, I've scanned uh, quite a few of these with the ultrasound, and, and some of them are uh, horrendously vascular, so you'll see a like, huge aberrant accumulations of vessels, cranial and caudal, to these masses, um, aberrant, um, aberrant nidus of vessels. And um, if you hit those, um, then I'm told that they can bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. So just be, be very careful about being tempted. If you can actually palpate a mass like this, just to start sticking needles in it blindly. Because if you if you hit one of um, these, these aberrant nidus of vessels, then it, can be faced with a dog that is bleeding profusely and you can struggle to stop it. This one, um, quite vascular, but, but not, not so much that I didn't feel like I could get a needle into the quarter pole here. And, and we did, um, and it came back um, as a thyroid carcinoma. Um, so that was the final diagnosis in this case. The um, reason why I put this one in is because um, there was an old dog, it had very vague clinical signs, and we've got thoracic radiographs. So, um, naturally you're going to spend most of the time um, looking at the thoracic structures. So does it have cardiac disease? Does it have pulmonary disease? Is there anything in the mediastinum? Um, is there anything affecting any of the extra thoracic structures like the ribs? Is there maybe a rib tumor here, something sneaky like that? Is there something affecting the thoracic vertebra? Um, could this dog have some sort of brown cell tumor and there are subtle loosened lesions within the thoracic, thoracic vertebral bodies? Um, and the answer here was that, that there is a lesion, um, but it's, it's kind of on the edge of the film. It's, it's very cranial, and you can only really see it in one of the views, in my lateral view. Um, and then, uh, yeah, being able to describe it and coming up with some reasonable differentials, um, which, which we absolutely did. And like I say, it turned out to be a thyroid mass, and then a little bit of a chat about um, how you examine the thyroids using ultrasound. So um, the landmarks, as I said, the trachea and the carotid artery, and you run and you probe down the neck um, keeping an eye on the trachea and the artery, and you're looking for um, a little echoic blob to just appear between the two, um, and then that's, that's the final one. All right, fabulous. So that brings us on to case number four, which is an um, eight-year-old female neutered cocker spaniel. Um, so uh, this little cocker has uh, recently had an episode of weakness, uh, while on a walk. So uh, you have examined this patient and you feel that its abdomen doesn't feel normal. Uh, you're pretty suspicious that there might be an abdominal mass here. So uh, you've taken some abdominal radiographs and these are the radiographs that you've got. So you've got a right lateral um, and you've got a DD. So anybody fancy having a go at case number four? And this is um, absolutely the sort of case that you can encounter in your first opinion practice. I can do this one. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Yep. And so we have now a lateral view well, of the abdomen and chest. 
um, of this yeah. topic. And um, so the first thing that obviously comes to um, to my view is this large ventral abdomen mass, rounded mass, and that is occupying most of the abdomen and is pushing um, all the intestines uh, dorsally and caudally. Um, I would say it's located where I would expect the spleen to be. Um, as you can see, you can still see the liver more or less well, not maybe a little bit pointed at the end, maybe a little bit enlarged in that sense, but more or less normal. And usually the spleen is just, um, just caudal to it. So my concern will be the dust and splenic mass. Um, the other thing that I can see in this radiograph is that the cardiac silhouette is quite difficult to see. Um, I'm not sure if there is some fluid as well in the chest because the, the cardiac silhouette seems to be kind of like, I don't know, I cannot see it clearly. Okay. Um, yeah, and maybe a little bit of um, tracheal um, displays dorsally as well in this view. So I'm not 100% about this chest, but I think because also it's been a radiograph of the chest and the abdomen uh, together, it may not be the best quality to assess the, the chest. But yeah, my main concern is that large um, abdominal mass, okay. which I will say that possibly is, is an splenic mass. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a, that's, that's a decent chat. Um, we haven't really paused too long on this DV radiograph because it isn't, isn't particularly useful. Um, I suppose um, in this view, uh, we can see the silhouette reasonably well, yeah. Um, yeah. And you're absolutely right, the um, border effacement of the cardiac silhouette is something that we expect to see in a patient that has um, a pleural effusion. And we might ex also expect to see some pleural fissure lines and, and some retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma. From the thoracic wall, um, I, I think I think you're right. Um, there maybe is some sort of effacement of the margins of the cardiac silhouette in this lateral view, but it, it, it looks pretty expiratory this view. Yeah. And as you've said, the the positioning is is really suboptimal. So uh, we've got some of the um, proximal portal fall in musculature superimposed of the cranial ventral thorax. It's a little bit oblique as well, so it, it isn't it isn't the best view. And, and there's nothing in this DV really to to make us too suspicious about an effusion. Um, however, uh, you are absolutely right that, that there is um, a large, clearly marginated soft tissue opaque structure in the mid abdomen, and that is displacing um, a lot of the structures around it, predominantly the small intestine, which is displaced dorsally um, and also cordally. Um, and yeah, I, I, I agree, normally we'd expect to see the spleen in, in this location. Um, there, there is a, a sort of a, a potentially a soft tissue a shadow just super, superimposed over the liver and, and this soft tissue mass, but it, it, it's a little bit more radiolucent relative to the liver and this mass. It, it could be a bit of a spleen, who knows, um, but certainly mid-abdominal mass. So uh, what we're going to do now is I'm just going to ping you guys another question via the poll. And uh, you can have your say in terms of where you think this mass is coming from. So do you think, um, as Michael suggested, it's a stomach mass? Or do you think it could be something else? Do you think it could be an hepatic mass? Do you think it could be an intestinal mass? Or do you think it might be something else? And I have to say that, um, yeah, I completely agree with Michael's description. I don't really think I would add anything else. Um, the only other thing that I might uh, add would be because this dog uh, has presented with episodes of weakness, and we're suspicious of something like a splenic mass, then uh, we need to be a little bit concerned about if this is a splenic mass, whether or not there's been any bleeding. So um, I'd probably comment on whether I felt the serosal detail in the abdomen was normal. Um, I think it is, um, which would suggest that if, if this is indeed a splenic mass, then um, on those radiographs, there's no convincing evidence that it's popped and this dog um, is full of hemorrhagic peritoneal effusion, um, but always a useful thing to include in the report. Okay, so plenty of people getting involved on the poll this time, so let's sync it up and we'll see what everybody thought. This takes a minute. Okay, so 11 responses. Let's see what we've got. So, vast majority of you guys think this is splenic, and I think that's absolutely reasonable. 
Um, you've got 36% of people think that it could be something else, um, which is uh, interesting. Um, I'd be uh, interested to know what uh, the other consists of here, if it's not hepatic and intestinal. Um, but yeah, I mean, splenic would, would probably be where I'd go with this. So splenic mass is um, certainly uh, one of the more common types of abdominal mass that we see. Um, it's in the mid-abdomen. Um, we can see the margins of the liver. Um, they, they look normal. Um, there's, there's nothing to suggest that this is a mass that is, is an intraluminal uh, intestinal mass. So the, the logic that we used to uh, decide that the thyroid mass was thyroidal and not esophageal and intraluminal applies here as well. So you know, if this was a giant intestinal mass and, and it had an intraluminal component, then we really expect to see some other changes. We might, we might see a gravel sign, we might see uh, focal dilated loops of bowel. We're not really seeing any of that. We're just, just seeing bowel that's, um, that's just being displaced. And um, it doesn't really look like this thing is coming from like the abdominal wall or, or anything else. I mean, it, it could just be a peritoneal mass, I suppose. Um, just something that's within the peritoneum, but that, that would be kind of weird. So fortunately, we have a CT scan, which, which we can take a look at. So this is a 2.5 millimeter post contrast soft tissue CT, which I'm just gonna play for you. So uh, for those of you that are not really used to CTs, I'll just stop it occasionally and point out some structures. So we are currently at the level of the uh, cranial abdomen. This, this is the diaphragm here. Uh, this is the cave, this is the aorta, and this is the gallbladder, and all of this is the liver. And we're going to continue to move cordially. Let's keep moving cordially. Okay, I'll just stop it there. So again, just to help orientate everyone. So this is now spleen here. This is stomach, this is more liver. That's portal vein, gallbladder. On and on. Okay, so some of these structures I'm sure you guys recognize. So we've got two kidneys full of contrast, which is completely normal. Um, we've got spleen down the bottom here, we're starting to see some bits of bowel, some of it small, some of it large. So we, we kind of expect to encounter this mass soon. Okay, and here it is. So this is our mass. Well, it doesn't really look like we would expect it to look. I mean, we've got spleen right next to it, so we're going to just suspend our disbelief for now and, and just continue to believe that this thing is going to originate from the spleen eventually. It's not doing it at the moment, but hopefully it will. So we'll keep going. And then we stop, and, and now we've we've got to the end of the spleen. So the spleen is here, and this mass is, is still going, and it doesn't really look like it's going to originate from the spleen at all. So. Let's run through the rest of the CT, and then that's pretty much it. So if we, if we bring it back, the mass starts around here. And immediately when we look at this, this mass, we're thinking, well, it, it doesn't really look like a soft tissue mass. So if this was a soft tissue mass, then we'd expect it to be soft tissue attenuating. And and it isn't, it's, it's hypo-attenuating relative to uh, the adjacent soft tissue structures like, like the spleen. So if we compare how uh, bright this mass is, so it's attenuation relative to the spleen, it's, it's not as bright. So it's unlikely that this mass uh, is, uh, is made up of soft tissue because it doesn't look the same as soft tissue on the CT. Um, but we, we can go beyond that and say, well, well actually, it actually looks like this, this mass is, has a wall, so it's, it's got a soft tissue attenuating wall, and then it's got actually what looks like fat in the non-dependent aspect of it. So even if you're not used to looking at CTs, if you compare the, the attenuation, so how bright or, or dark this portion of the mass is relative to the peritoneal fat around it, it's equivalent. So it kind of looks like the non-dependent part of this mass is made up of fat. Um, and uh, not only that, but, but we've got a very horizontal line in the non-dependent aspect of this mass and, and that's something that you, you tend to see with fluid um, so a dorsal horizontal border um, is, is really indicative of something that is, is fluid filled so it's looking like this is is a big fluid filled peritoneal structure which is not really what we expected at all so i'll just run this on 
again. And it's essentially just, just more of the same. And the only other things that we might want to comment on here on the CT um, is the fact that a lot of the fat um, around this, this structure um, is uh, quite streaky and, and hyper attenuating. So, so there is a little, a little bit of inflammation um, of the adjacent fat surrounding the structure. Um, but the main features here on the CT are the fact that it's, it's peritoneal. Um, so this, this, this structure, it, it doesn't originate from the spleen, it doesn't originate from the intestines, it doesn't come from the liver, um, it doesn't really come from anything. It's, it's just a big, round, fluid-filled mass right in the middle of the peritoneum. And having examined this mass further after reviewing the CT, the sort of differentials that we should be thinking about now are uh, well, mass is the you tend to see in the peritoneum, and so we're going down the road of well, you know, is this a big peritoneal cyst? Um, is this um, a big peritoneal um, abscess? Uh, you know, could there be a foreign body in there somewhere that we can't see? I mean, could could this be something weird, like like um, like a gossip pipe bone, or is somebody maybe left left a swab in here or left something in here, and we've got a big abscess surrounding it? Um, so not really what we expected. Um, certainly, what what I expected when we see to this patient was a splenic mass, and, and that, that isn't what we ended up with. Uh, so what I'm going to do now uh, is just minimize this for a second. If I can. I'm just gonna show you guys uh, just a little video. Uh, so uh, this, this is the video of this, this structure. And this is what it looked like uh, when it uh, was removed surgically. Um, and uh, I would recommend that if uh, anybody uh, is eating their tea, um, they look away now because it's it's not particularly pleasant. Okay, so I'll just play this video for you. It just looks looks a little bit like that. Okay, so this this mass absolutely full of pus. So, this mass actually turned out to be uh, a, a peritoneal abscess, and the pathologists, um, they weren't able to uh, find any evidence of a foreign body um, or uh, any other structures um, that might have been responsible for it. So, effectively, a sterile peritoneal abscess. Um, so yeah, a really weird one. Um, I absolutely agree with your pretty rough description writer. For me, this this was going to be a splenic mass. Um, I I was pretty certain that what we were going to find was a big mass um, just on the tail of the spleen. Um, and uh, what we found was a big, clearly marginated, fluid-filled structure um, that uh, turned out to be a sterile peritoneal abscess. Um, so yeah, you, you never know. Um, even radiographs where you are really confident um, of the lesion um, and, and what's probably underlying. So in that case, you know, we're thinking, could this dog have something like an hemangiosarcoma? Um, yeah, it turns out to be something completely different. Okay, so that's that's all of our cases for this evening. Does, does anybody have any questions about uh, the last case? Um, or, uh, yeah, um, does anybody have uh, any questions about any of tonight's cases? Because if you do, then now's the chance. So I see that um, uh, Nicoletta has just asked, uh, actually it was Luke that asked, any rim enhancement? Yeah, I, I, I think I think it probably was um, on, on the CT. It probably was a little bit of enhancement um, of the rim of this structure, which, which retrospectively is something that you might expect to see um, with an abscess. Um, so yeah, that's uh, again um, quite a pertinent imaging feature here to take away. So if we just have a look at that. And yeah, this, this, this very thin wall that that is that is enhancing all right if anybody else has any questions then now's your time if not then i will say farewell uh, thank you all very much uh, for joining me uh, again this evening and uh, i will hopefully um see you all again uh, next month okay thanks guys um, enjoy your evening and uh, i'll see you all again very soon Bye bye. Thanks, Liam. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Está impuntado.
Thank you. Bye.